Good evening to you all out there and a very warm welcome to this virtual tasting where I will be talking about free bottlings from the current August outturn. The free bottlings are 85.61, G814 and R2.10. So you see, we're, we're getting around with those spirits. My name is Olaf, Olaf Meyer, and I'm a brand ambassador for the Scotch More Whiskey Society, as well as one of the chairpersons of the panel. For those who don't know me, I, I'm a German national, having lived in the UK for over 25 years, there of 20 years in Edinburgh, and I love to share my passion for whiskey and for rum. That's probably why I'm sitting here this evening. And for the people who do know me, I can talk about whiskey and rum. I can bladder on for hours and hopefully occasionally some things make sense. Uh, but uh, in an old Wizardus book from the vaults, uh, for people who have been a long, long time, actually this Wizardus book doesn't exist anymore because we had to stop it after we stopped free coffee, which uh, is another story for uh, another day. Uh, and also these days, everyone just writes comments online on, on various websites, anonymous, uh, but don't get me started on this one either. Uh, but we had used to have an old visitor's book and people could write in. Uh, one of the most famous people was Prince Charles. He wrote, signed it on the 7th of June, 1990, uh, when he visited the vaults. And I hope we had a good selection of distillery number 29 behind the bar for him. But there is one entry in that book and uh, it goes as follows. It says, be warned, Olaf will talk your ears off, but listen well, because every word he says, it's worth remembering. I didn't write that, someone else did. Uh, not sure if that's true, but uh, here we go. Uh, I've also looked it up because quite interesting. We in German have a saying, in der Kürze liegt die Würze, which is actually very different uh, to to the English, which it says, keep it short and sweet. So in, in English, it's sweet. And in German, it's the spiciness. So keep it short and spicy. Uh, or I keep it with Shakespeare. Uh, he let Polonius say in Hamlet, brevity is the soul of wit. Uh, so here we go. Actually, Boris Johnson said we all have to lose some weight. So I can tell you I'm successfully on a whiskey diet and I've already lost three days. So uh, enough of talking. Let's get to the bottles. The first bottling, 85.61. That's the first one we're going to have. And uh, it's the 85th distillery, the 61st cask from the 85th distillery, 13 years old, from a refill bourbon hogshead. Oh, my beloved bourbon hogsheads. I love those hoggies. Uh, I've been living with those since I have no whiskey since 1983. They get less and less these days. It's all now smaller casks as well, like uh, the barrels, of course, uh, but then the firkins, the kilberkins, the blood tubs, you name it, the quarter casks. But that's the hoggy. That's what the industry has used for uh, over the last hundred of hundred years. 58.2% uh, alcohol, and it's juicy oak and vanilla, as you can see from the, from the coloring as well. That's the flavor profile we gave it. And the title, as you can see on the screen, a classic sunset holiday dish, lemon angel pie. Lemon custard, filling sandwich between a crunchy meringue crust and plenty of whipped cream. Alone the descriptor, descriptor makes me smile. And uh, actually all three drums we're having this evening could be under that heading. They make me smile. And not because I'm drunk too much, no, because just of the aromas and the taste of those three. And in the current situation, as we've been in for the last five months and God knows for how much longer, that's not a bad thing to smile. So, a real sniffer stram, I call it. I love nosing whiskey. Don't you worry, I'll drink it as well, but it's the nose because the nose, the aroma can be so evocative and can put you into a place or back in time as well, like probably only music can do as well. And this one here, when I nosed it, it brought me right back to summer holidays in the Mosel region in Germany, between Bernkastel and Peaceport, two very, very famous uh, uh, towns uh, with very famous vineyards. Bernkastel is the Bernkastel doctor. And in Peaceport, you've got the Goldtröpfchen uh, from Peaceport. And we're right in the middle between those two towns. 
sitting at the vineyard overlooking the Mosul, seeing the sunset as well. Actually, it was a very good spot for seeing the sunset. And we're drinking. Well, I've been the driver, so I had to drink grape juice. And I drank the Mosul grape juice. There you go. Maybe you can see it. Gaiusley grape juice. So from the from the grapes, from the vineyards, just all around you, that's what they're making. They're making a white and a red grape juice. And uh, Gaiusley actually very famous. Uh, it's been mentioned by Roald Dahl in a short story aptly called Taste, and that was first published in 1945. So a few years ago. But if you talk a few years ago, actually that vineyard is in the 19th. 19th generation now uh, of, of the same family, uh, started off at 1465. Uh, but that sort of puts it into perspective. Columbus didn't even think about getting to America there uh, at this time. So, and uh, if I'm nosing this and I'm sitting there, it's just, that's what it is. It's just, it's, it's sunshine, it's sweet fruitiness in a, in, in a glass. And uh, let's try it. Beautiful, fresh, fruity, very delicate sweetness. And you think, wow, great. But right then, right at the back, followed by a sort of citric, spicy attack, almost I would call it, white pepper, maybe a bit of wood spice as well, and then a bit of lemon or a slight tonic finish uh, in it as well. So an awful lot going on here in the mouth uh, over just a seconds at the end of the day uh, so certainly for me that can take a drop of water because that attack on the spice was probably slightly a little bit too much for me so here we go I've got my my noggin with my glass with my water in it so uh, what I'll do is I'll just add a few drops of water Give it a bit of time. And it really is that freshness. That's, again, coming right out of it. That lemon freshness, lavender, freshly laundered sheets probably hanging on the on the washing line or on a, on a meadow. But there's also a lovely sweetness of almond croissants and, of course, that lemon angel pie. Where That's why it's got the title. It's got a... Mmm, a lovely creamy texture now, wonderfully creamy, that, that meringue, that lemony, there's still an astringency there, there's still a little bit of, I would even call it saltiness, uh, which you find in Manzanilla sherries from San Luca as well. So in a way, having that one here with green olives by the side, overlooking the Mosul, enjoying the sunset, for me, as it says as well in the tasting note, a perfect aperitif. And actually, the best way, 7 a.m. in New Zealand, well, it's never too early to have a to have a, a, a glass of whiskey. The old Scottish saying is, do you have, do you have a whiskey yet? Uh, and the answer is not a drop. Did you have breakfast yet? Not a drop. So that's, so you look after that. By the way, there's an old pirate saying as well with the rum, Drinking rum before 10 o'clock doesn't make you a drunken, it makes you a pirate. So there we go. Uh, oh, sunny Switzerland. Patrick, hello. <laughs> Glad to have you with me. Uh, so here we go. Uh, perfect dram, I was about to say, because I love that the nose neat and I love the taste with a drop of water. So you've got the best of both worlds. You can nose it for as long as you want. Then you add a few drops of water and then you can enjoy it on the palate for me almost perfect. Now, I always say to you, don't think all about the, the information, the facts and everything. You get so much overload. So basically everything I told you, I shouldn't have told you at the beginning. Try the whiskey, see if you like it. And if you like it, it's a good whiskey. If you don't like it, it's a bad whiskey for you. That doesn't mean it's a bad whiskey for your next neighbor sitting there or for your friend or for your colleague or anything or for... That's what it is. It's all about personal preferences. 
But all I'm saying as well, when you then like it or don't like it, afterwards get the information because then you might see some common denominators why you like X whiskies and not Y whiskies. And with this one here, with the 85, I'm actually sort of thinking I'll have to start a new appreciation circle called the Worm Tub Club. Worm Tub, because that refers to the condenser which cools the vapor down back into liquid form after distillation. And most distilleries these days have a so-called shell and tube condenser. Simplified, it's a copper shell with crisscrossing hundreds of copper tubes inside. And inside that is cold water. And the vapor comes through there and touches the cold water and therefore goes back into liquid form. That's what 80, 90% of all distilleries use these days. Uh, the simple worm tub is a vat filled with cold water. So you're filling cold water at the bottom continuously. And there is a worm in it. I use sort of a, a copper worm, possibly about 100 meters long in total. And the vapor goes through that coil uh, and the cold water then puts it back into liquid form. The big difference between those two is copper contact. Because the more copper contact you have, the more you're taking off the heavy compounds and also the sulfur-free compounds. I've heard uh, Bill Lumsden once saying, uh, the, the, I don't know what his title is at, at Glenmorangie these days, but that about 20 times more copper contact is happening at a shell and tube condenser compared to a worm tap. That's obviously a guesstimate. I mean, it all depends on other things as well. Like it always is in, in whiskey, so many varieties. But let's say one thing, there's a lot more copper contact on shell and tube condensers compared to worm taps. And uh, therefore, I'm sure not all distilleries or all whiskies that come from worm taps I like, but uh, it's the beauty about single cask as well. But I made a list of those distilleries and it's not by any shape or form a correct list. So I'm sure someone's going to write in and say, you've forgotten this one or this one is not quite correct. But just sort of give you an idea about worm taps. So there's Craig Allergy. Actually, that's the one I visited in February just before lockdown for the first time. And it's fascinating because they got their worm tops on top of the roof. So you get on top of it, you look into the worm tops. And in February, it was pretty cold. So it was looking just like sort of hot tops you know, with the steam coming off them. The second one is Balmenach, which actually that was the only one I saw worm top empty because you don't see them empty, really, because they need to be full because otherwise you start seeing cracks and they can leak. Uh, but that was the first time. And just to give you another, as I say, uh, distilleries, Crag and Moor, Mortlach, Nokdu, Ben Rennes, Speyburn, Oban, Royal Loch Nagar, Plankinchi, Pultney, Talisker, Edradour, Springbank, not quite, but near enough. They have one worm chop for one of the two spirit stills. And the new ones as well, quite exciting. Balindaloch and Adnaho uh, have both worm chops. Dolwini is an interesting one because they had worm chops. In the 1980s, they were moved to shallow tube condenser because it's a lot easier to maintain. It's a lot cheaper. And uh, therefore, they've done that. But they've gone right back to 1995, probably about 10 years later, back to worm chaps. And of course, I missed this one here, the 85, which we're drinking, because I don't want to tell you what it is. Well, of course, you can look it up, but uh, I can give you a little bit of advice. It's called Glen. Well, it's not a Glen, but it's called Glen, if you know what I mean. And it's followed by the town, which is the home of the Lantern of the North. So uh, that's this one you've got here. Uh, but maybe after all this talk, I probably just like worm taps because actually the ones we still use today, they were invented by a German chemist called Christian Weigel back in 1717. So uh, that's what it, that's maybe one of the reasons as well. Well, on to number two, certainly no worm taps, not even pot stills, as we have a G. And uh, the big G, sorry, never really quite sure how that works. The back G standing for grain whiskey. So it's G8 and uh, 14, the 14th cask, another refill hoggy. 164 bottles. The angels must have liked it. 56.4% alcohol. So still high alcohol because it's 29 years old. Uh, so therefore, it certainly hasn't gone in at 63 and a half uh, because uh, otherwise it would have had a lot less alcohol. Uh, grain whiskey gets distilled up to into the 90s, 
maximum 94.8% alcohol, and then gets higher into the cast than the 63.5%, which is normal. But as Sigmund Freud, an Austrian neurologist, once said, 100% of the truth does simply not exist, as does not 100% of alcohol. So here we are, the G8.13. Markus, good evening. Got my Swiss friends, friends here. <laughs> right, and uh, the whiskey bubble from Germany. Uh, so it's a lowland distillery. Well, it was a lowland distillery because it's closed like so many of those grain distilleries. Uh, it opened as a grain distillery because it was a malt distillery before in 1823. And it was one of the original five which founded DCL, which then became Diageo later. That was in 1877. It closed in 1993 for good. And as I say, our cask uh, 14 was distilled on the 18th of June 1990. So just about three years before it closed its door. And uh, the price, I think I have to say was £105 because I think it is already sold out. Because I can tell you one thing, it is worth every penny of those £105. Uh, Oscar Wilde once said, uh, a cynic knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I can tell you, this one, as I say, it's well worth it. A wonderful color. I, you probably can't see that with the light and it's getting it's getting dark again soon or now. With the, so beautiful and, and, and sort of long legs and fat legs coming down, really oily, lovely color. And a sublime nose. As I say, another nosing drum, another one which makes me smile. Fresh sawn oak wood, a beautiful, delicate sweetness, a bit of cinnamon, a bit of nutmeg. It's all there. It's juicy oak and vanilla as well, suppo supposedly, I say. There you go. That's the, that's the one. But it couldn't be more different to the first one. But that's what it's all about with those flavor profiles as well. Uh, actually, when we're going to try, I'm going to try it in a second. And I would even call it, maybe it might be even spicy and sweet because there is a lovely sweetness to it and spiciness as well to it. So those flavor profiles are very good guidelines. But uh, in panels, I always say it's just like going to the doctor. You ask three people to get an opinion about it and you get four different answers. And that's really what it is at the end of the day. So here we've got uh, a grain whiskey, juicy oak and vanilla. And the nose is, as I said, divine. And with the palate, I was in the Mosel with the first one. I'm now drinking a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Melon, pineapple, dancing on the tongue. Quite active still, being being the, the the amount of alcohol you still have, which I like. So it's not too long in the wood there. It's it's got a nice maturity, a little bit of linseed oil as well, a little bit of spice, balanced by sweetness, toffee, fudge maybe. As I say, I could have easily put that like this into the spicy and sweet uh, category. Now, you can add water. I always recommend people try it first without water. You can always then try and add water and add more water to it as well. But uh, if you don't want to add water, and I know quite a few people, and I had a few Swiss people on there and a few Germans as well, they usually always say, oh, I never, never, never add water to my whiskey. I mean, that's just that's just sacrilege and uh, fine to them. I give you two points uh, for you if you don't want to add water. The first one, as I'm not Scottish, I can tell you that a Scotsman apparently likes two things naked. One being his whiskey. The other one, I leave to your imagination what that might be. And secondly, if God really wanted us to drink water, he wouldn't have salted 97% on this earth. Just, just think about it. So therefore, you don't have to add water, but you certainly can add water. And I'll, I'll add a drop just to see, because it certainly will change. Be a little bit more careful with that one because uh, you can easily drown a whiskey 29 years old and also a grain whiskey even more so ah i'm getting sort of mulled wine sort of a uh, black tea maybe earl grey tea a bit of bergamot rum and raisin 
certainly hasn't hurt it. I still think I, I preferred it neat on the nose. Oh, very, everything a little bit tamer, sort of sun soaked sultanas. And uh, dare I say, sort of an Amontillado, maybe even an Oloroso. We had a Manzanilla sherry beforehand, sort of going a little bit up in the in the maturation as well. There's some oxidative maturation in there, like in the sherry. So, yeah, as I say, wonderful, wonderful. And if you've got a bottle, don't keep it. Just open it and share it with your friends. Only good friends, very good friends, actually. So we were technical with the first one. Uh, with the worm taps, let's go a bit into the history, just a little touch of history, because this whiskey was very much in the forefront of what was a famous uh, discussion about what is whiskey. Because the problem was, uh, well, not the problem, but the issue was back in uh, 1905 in uh, Islington, in London, they were starting to say that when you have a whiskey which is 90% grain and 10% malt whiskey, like a blend, you can't call it whiskey because it can only be called whiskey when it's 100% malted barley. Now, that was the issue. And uh, of course, that was all the Highland distillers which were fighting against DCL, which had all the five grain distilleries plus some malt distilleries. Uh, and they obviously arguing, no, no, everything is Scotch whiskey. And uh, eventually in 1908, there was a royal commission formed uh, to decide what is whiskey. And quite interestingly, at the same time, sort of where all this rumbling was going on in those three years, this distillery came out with a uh, green whiskey into the market, which you very rarely find these days. Uh, there is, uh, I'm not quite sure which one it is, uh, Cameron Brick. Yeah, Cameron Bridge has one. Obviously, that's also the Hague uh, ones, the coming from the Hague Club one, a uh, green whiskey. But this one had an advertising back in the early 1900s, light and delicate and exquisite. Pure patent still Scotch grain whiskey, seven years old, matured in wood. And now it comes the whiskey with an individuality notably different to all others in peculiar delicacy and charm of flavor, mild and mellow, a soft, round, natural, wholesome stimulant that ministers to good health and neither affects the head nor the liver. This is not a pot still whiskey. And the slogan was, not a headache in a gallon. Well, I wonder what the advertising board would say to this today. Uh, so that came out at the same time. And in 1908, the Royal Commission eventually came up with basically saying, uh, everything which is grain whiskey or malt whiskey is be called whiskey. So basically they started the, the, the category of whiskey and also the legal definition of whiskey. And uh, if that wouldn't have been the case, I don't think we had many of those malt distilleries today, which we are, which we can enjoy. So uh, there you are, a bit of history on top of the worm tuck. Uh, well, God in his goodness sent alcohol to cheer both great and small. Little fools will drink too much and great fools none at all. We don't belong to these guys. We'll have a little drink. And uh, as Oscar Wilde said again, consistency is the last refuge of the unimaginative. And uh, we in the Scotchmore Whiskey Society, we are very imaginative. And here we go. You can see it on the label already, slightly different, because we now got a rum R2.10. So it's the second distillery and the 10th cask from that distillery. And uh, the price of that one is 79.50. And when I last looked, I think there were still a few bottles left. Here, yeah, nice review, I enjoyed 26. Oh, yes. 26 is always a good one, Pear. I agree with you. Uh, so we've got R2. It's from Guyana. And there is no price for guessing which distillery that will be because it's called Diamond Distillery. That's the only one there with an amalgamation of many, many different stills. Their famous brand, if you go into the shop, is El Dorado. That comes from the Guyanese Diamond uh, Distillery. What we got here is a 16 year old from a second fill bourbon barrel. Just like whiskey as well, they normally in the, in the, in the Caribbean 
for rum using the U.S. barrels after they've been used once in the U.S., they go down to the Caribbean. Uh, the exceptions are the French islands like Martinique, Guadeloupe. Uh, they're using French oak normally from Armagnac and Cognac making in France. Uh, El Dorado is the brand, but the real existence of all these Guyanese rums was in the past for Navy rums, because Navy rum was mainly blended between Guyana rum, Barbados and Jamaica. Those were the three main rums, and it was a mixture of pot stills as well as column stills. Uh, so I'm not quite sure actually what we're having here, if it's a pot still or a column still. I would assume it's a column still, but I, I can't I can't tell you for sure. But uh, Totally tropical, coconut, bananas, pineapple, papaya, you name it. But there's also something behind it, sort of a hint of tobacco, furniture polish. Yep, there is. It's a bit of sort of. Fifty nine point two percent. Yeah, you get a bit of the good old uh, alcohol tingle as well in the nose. So I'll give it a bit of a try. Mm. Wow, that's big. That is big and beautiful on the palate. Oily, treacle, dark treacle, chocolate, bitterness, a little bit of a petrol, salted lime in the back. That's big. I like this sort of thing. Um, it's, it's not your typical rum, as you would expect it. It's not your sweet rum. Uh, well, dare I say, a lot of the sweet rums add quite a bit of sugar to it. But uh, again, don't get me started because I said I want to be brief. So I'll try and be brief. So I think that one needs a bit of water for me personally. So what I'll do is, and rum is the thing. It's not, it's a good swimmer normally rum. So you can't, you can't really drown it. So here we go. Should really give it a bit more time, but uh, I've done that before anyway, so I've done my notes as well. So I have sun, sand, calypso, raggy, you name it. I mean, it's it's all it's all there. But actually, we're also maintaining, as we call it in the tasting note, a two-stroke engine, a ship's engine. We're we'll polishing brass on a ship's lantern. So this is real pirate stuff we've got here. Sort of ho ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Not to be pedantic, but actually the pirates preferred brandy uh, to rum, so they were usually drinking brandy. That's what they took off the off the ships as well. Uh, but then, I would have preferred brandy probably if I would have been a pirate, because in those days rum was called Kill Devil, and there was a reason why it was Kill Devil because it was pretty violent stuff. Not this one here. Still dark. But now more, much more sweetness. And if you leave that for another five or ten minutes, there's even more sweetness coming out. And uh, the best way I can say it is just like a spoonful of sugar, which makes the medicine go down. And that's what that is here. A bit of cough medicine, maybe with a, on a trifle and a little bit of demerara sugar. Hello, Gordon. Hopefully see you again sometime soon. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind these tastings, but I still love to see you in person and in the flesh and uh, get reactions from you guys. So very bold, very flavorsome. As I said earlier on, not really what you maybe expect from a rum, but then that's what the rums are. And that's what it says as well in the title. Explore, experience and enjoy, because that's what it's all about. But as I say, don't be shy. Just give it a try because you never know i mean you might like it uh before i leave uh there are i'll make my little uh sales pitch there are the gathering packs uh we have the annual gathering again in september which of course is going to be different to the ones we've had before in the vaults as well as in queen street gardens uh but there is will be uh, an online uh tasting on the 6th of september and the gathering packs are on sale on the website. So it would be nice to see you, if not in person, at least uh, virtual. And uh, Ian, thank you. Uh, oh, well, I would, I would rather be in Campbelltown at the moment, Ian. Uh, and uh, no, so that's that's on, on that front. 
And uh, I'll just keep it with Mark Twain, who once said, it's better to keep your mouth shut and appear stupid than to open it and remove all doubt. And with that, I'll keep my mouth shut. I say thank you very much for being with me here tonight. Uh, I wish you all the very best. And uh, slange. <laughs>